Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our new microscope. Uh, I don't know if, this, if it's the first time for you guys coming for the microscope. Can you raise your hand if it's your first time? Oh, that's a lot of people. Yeah, me too. But this is not the first time we do this, so you should come more often. Uh, microscope started as an initiative by the employees on ships that classify media. Ships, what you would say? Well, ships that is, uh, it's a company well, about uh, classified ads. So if you have heard of Mil Anuncios, Segunda Mano, Fotocasa, or so on, that's ships that classify media. So it uh, started like that as an initiative from the employees. Uh, and then after its success, initial success, the company decided to sponsor it. So this is why we have a fancy place to do it instead of a garage underground, pretty crappy, with water. We're going to have some drinks, beer maybe? Yeah, beer later on. So I'm not presenting. I'm just a silly guy who is talking before the guys who are presenting, the workers. Uh, so uh, Gallo and Guillermo are going to talk. You have a really easy to type uh, hashtag to do your comments, rants, or whatever. It's TikToks or SCH Tech Talks. And uh, one last thing before that, since we are being sponsored by Shifter, our company, I must tell you that we are hiring. And uh, it's an amazing place to work. Yeah, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, drink a beer with us. We can talk about that later. Uh, you will see how cool it's working there. And that's the corporate stuff. So now I will leave you with these guys, which, is, which are less corporate than me. And <laughs> Let's get it on. Okay. Yeah. See? See? Um, hello, so my name is uh, Gallo. I'm an engineer at uh, Shifted, as we know. I'm working on the engineering productivity team with Guillermo. Uh, and um, yeah, I've been working for most of my professional life on the JVM, uh, which may be good or bad. but. Uh, so some, we are going to talk about uh, memory management on the JVM. I'll talk about the agenda before uh, starting. Um, yeah, so we'll see what it is about. Um, and you present yourself later or now? You just present. Me. Okay, so Gracias. good. Gracias. Yo lo le doy. Okay, so the agenda is going to be basically this. We are going to assume that most of you have some basic Java or JVM knowledge. You know what? this is about, you have written some Java, you know what the garbage collector is, etc. If you don't or you need some context about something, just stop and, and we'll explain a bit better. Um, we will see a bit a few slides on uh, how would you understand your application's workload or footprint in terms of uh, memory usage. Um, that's looking at some tools, the output of some of those tools and how would you interpret uh, that output. And then uh, we will, I will talk a bit on some techniques to improve that, and Guillermo will especially focus on some more advanced um, techniques that you can do, not, not necessarily to improve the, the performance, um, but some trade-offs that you can make when you really need to squash uh, your memory usage uh, patterns. Uh, you will have to pay something in exchange, but um, if memory is important, then this is the kind of things that you will, you will want to do. Okay, so um, one of the main advantages, I'm actually going to move here so you can see something. Uh, one of the main advantages of the JVM and, and Java in general, sorry, Java and in general, should I change the, yeah, yeah, oops. Okay, so uh, one of the advantages of using the JVM and uh, Java and, and in general the JVM is um, the ability to, but the JVM can do um, fast very fast allocation and release of memory, um, even faster than C and C++. It does. <laughs> um, and it can optimize your memory usage on, on runtime. Uh, those are things that are usually very valuable for developers because they are uh, complex things that you don't need to worry about when you're writing your application. The, the JVM will do it for you. Um, but at the same time, if you leave it unchecked, you, will, you may have some problems, especially or what you usually see on Java applications is uh, big latency spikes. So you have response times that are more or less like this, and then suddenly they go up. Or uh, a lot of jitter. So it goes something like that. Um, and also you have me high memory footprint. Some of the, all the data that you're storing in memory is going to be fatter than it would be if you were using C++ or C or, or other languages. <clears throat> this is uh, JSTAT. It's one of the tools that comes uh, with, the, with any JDK. Uh, 
this is going to fall, uh, with the JDK, and it shows uh, what is more or less a healthy application, or what, what a, a healthy JVM would be behaving as. Uh, what you can see in here, this uh, you can get this with just RTC and the PID. I forgot to put that. Uh, and you see a number of columns. Uh, these two are survivor spaces. The C is the capacity and the U is the utilization. Um, this is the E then. Ugh, that's the old generation and the other ones we don't care about uh, now. So what the JVM is doing here is assuming the generational hypothesis, which as you know says that uh, we assume that most of the objects are going to be very short-lived. Uh, so we will behave as if that was true. Uh, what is happening in this case is precisely that. You can see that the capacity and the uh, utilization and the Eden, the utilization is going up and then suddenly goes down to zero. It goes up again, goes down to zero, goes up again, etc. That means that the application is allocating uh, memory for objects. Um, those are not used anymore, so the garbage collector comes and removes them, and that keeps happening uh, constantly. If you look at the old generation utilization, it doesn't change. What this means is that all of the objects that we are creating as the application works are very short-lived. So this is uh, validating the, the generational hypothesis. Um, we are not going to look into uh, garbage collection tuning, uh, but this is the kind of pattern that you should look for when you tune garbage collect collection. Size the Eden, the Eden, the, the Eden generation, in such a way that you can fit all of the short-lived objects that happen regularly, and they don't need to get promoted to the old generation. That's a, generally a good thing because uh, whenever objects go to the old generation, they will pile up in there for a long time, and eventually they will have to get garbage collected. That garbage collecting on the old generation is a bit is more expensive than on the on the Eden. So in general, you want something that looks like this. Um, another way that you can use to analyze your application uh, memory usage is on GC logs. These kind of options, probably these or a, a superset of these, should be enabled in all JVMs. It's, it doesn't have that much um, overhead. We'll give you output like this. I'm not sure that you can see from the bottom, but this is going to be on the internet. <clears throat> um, what you can see here are several ages. So every time that an object, that there's a garbage collection on the Eden, uh, you know that an object gains uh, an age. So these are objects that are successfully uh, or staying alive after a few generations, a few garbage collections on the Eden. Um, and you can see already here that at age four, there's a huge number of objects. And then at age five, they disappear. What this means is simply that um, the majority of objects that we are creating are staying alive for this period of time, the period of time that takes to do four uh, collections on the Eden. This already shows, however, some problems, uh, which you can see here and there. The time to perform this garbage collection has gone to two seconds. And this means that we are having pauses on our application that are caused by GC that are stopping completely all the application for two seconds. That means that, for example, we are not serving requests to our users. This can, it may not be a problem in a, in a batch application, but it will be if it's a real-time application. And you can see that the main cause for this to happen is on object copy. Object copy, uh, again, I'm assuming that you know that the, um, there's two survivor spaces. The JVM on the Eden is copying objects from one survivor space to another, then to another, uh, and back and forth. So every time that objects move from H1, 2, 3, 4, they are being copied from one side, one place to another. If you look at the amount of objects that we are moving, that more or less justifies why you are spending so much time copying objects. You're simply getting memory and moving it back and forth. And this is when generating garbage may become a problem. This shows how you can uh, create a problem on, by generating garbage. This is a different pattern. I'm not going to explain it that much. But you can see five seconds in here. Same cause. Most of it is uh, uh, object copying. Um, this looks a bit different, and, and the cause is interesting. That's a humongous allocation. In this case, what is happening is that we are having a, a huge object um, trying, being allocated on the stack. Huge objects are those that are bigger than half of a, a region in the G1 collector. Uh, that needs to allocate a lot, of, a lot of space. It triggers the garbage collection, and we fall in a similar, in a similar problem. We need to move a lot of objects from, one, from different places to another, from different regions, and that causes a huge pause. Uh, GC Viewer uh, is a very useful tool that helps you visualize many of the logs, uh, like the ones that I showed before, in a graphical way. This graph comes from the logs that we showed uh, before. 
And what you can see, maybe not from the, bottom, from the back, uh, something like this. This is uh, requests are starting to appear in here. The application is more or less stable, but as requests start coming, we feel the, the old generation, which means that objects need to get promoted to the old generation. The hidden stays more or less um, stable. And at this point, all around this, um, there's a lot of jitter in the uh, gray line, which is the used, um, the used uh, size, the used memory in the Eden. This is hard to see, but well. What happens in here, eventually something like this. The, this more or less recovers. This, this was because the requests started, uh, stopped coming. At this point, we start getting requests again, and we enter in the same pattern. There's a lot of objects being moved from one place to another, a lot of objects being promoted to the pink area, which is the old generation. At some point, this thing collapses. The, the garbage collector uh, creates an application post that is huge. Um, and the application actually died right after that because the garbage collector was consuming all the CPU time and leaving no time for the, for the application. So this is the kind of, of thing that you may end up seeing in, a, in an application that is not managing memory correctly. Um, when you want to examine what, is in, what are the objects, what is the, the data that you are creating that is generating these problems, you can use uh, JMAP. Um, there's also the possibility of getting a heap dump. The problem is if you are getting a 100 gig um, heap that is getting full, it's usually not very convenient and not even possible to get a dump of the 100 gig in a server and then ship it back to your laptop so you can open it or not and see what is in there. So typically what you end up doing is uh, getting a histogram like that. And this already tells you usually very valuable information like here. Uh, you know what objects are in memory and what objects you have an, an immense amount of and you generally know your application, so you know where they are. They may be coming from. This uh, case in particular is interesting because you can see that we have three million instances of that JDBC record, and there's also three million instances of this and that, um, long array lists and strings. The the one on the top is the histo. This includes both live objects and dead objects. This one is uh, after histo live which is uh, it, it runs a garbage collection, and then it reports only the objects that are alive. And here you can see a very clear correlation between the amount of JDBC records and the amount of longs, uh, arrays, strings, and objects and characters. What is happening in here is that you, get, you have some object like that. It was actually some object like that. It had a, a list of objects, a, a timestamp, and strings. Um, we will talk a bit more later about how, what, what you can do about this, or what is wrong about that. Uh, there is also, uh, when you are trying to understand how your code produce, uh, generates garbage, uh, JMH can be helpful. Um, there's a JC profiler, which you can add on, uh, on a JMH benchmark like that. And it will generate an output that looks like that. So after a, uh, on each iteration, it will print the allocation rate, uh, the allocation rate normalized and the churn on different spaces on the, on the heap, as well as the count and the time. So this is telling you how much garbage is being, or the rate of garbage that's being generated in, a, in your application. You usually don't want to do this with a whole application. You want to take a small chunk of code that is in the critical path, or is, is something that is being executed constantly for every single request, and see how, ma how much uh, garbage this is uh, generating. This is also useful because it, tells you, it allows you to do um, capacity planning. If you know how, many, uh, how much garbage you are generating per request, you know how, much, uh, garbage you can, how many requests you can do at the same time to, that fit in the Eden, and that helps you size the, the, the heap. OK, so I'm going to talk about some best practices first, and then Guillermo will go on the, on the complicated stuff. Where's the time? Huh? Time? Son las siete pero dos. OK. Um, OK, so the, the first point, uh, or the main point that, that I would like to highlight is um, it's very good to consider the cost of our abstractions. As I said before, the JVM helps us by taking some of the complexity away from the developer. You don't need to think about uh, memory management. But uh, that comes at a cost, and the cost is that the, the uh, JVM and the Java language is, is wrapping your data with a set 
some other information that is helping it uh, perform its function. For example, you can look at the, at the code, this is open source, so you can look at that, what is in the, in the representation of an object um, on those links. For example, on a 64-bit uh, JDK, um, you are going to be wrapping every object with an object header that has 16 bytes. On 32-bit, it's 12 bytes. References, um, arrays, everything that you create on the JVM is usually not going to be the raw data that you need to represent it. It's going to be something else. Um, one of the typical things that may be included in there is how many uh, the monitors that you, uh, that you use for synchronized primitives, etc. One very, very common problem on, on Java applications is boxing. If you have a long, or you're representing, let's say, a timestamp with a long, and that's what we saw in the, in the garbage collection logs before and the histogram, a long is 8 bytes. In Java, that's 8 bytes plus the object header, that's 16, so we go to 24 bytes. That's three times as much data to represent the same thing as you would do in, in C, in Rust, and in other languages. Um, it can be worse. In, a, in the case of a Boolean, which you can represent with a single bit, you actually need one byte, and you need the header, and you need three bytes for padding, because uh, the JVM will always pad at uh, multiples of eight, I think, or four, wait. Um, so this goes to uh, uh, 16 bytes. So you're multiplying for 128, uh, the size of your actual data. Um, that's a real world uh, example. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was doing a, a system that basically had a cache in, in memory for the whether a song was licensed to play in a given country for a given user that has certain permissions. Um, this could be in, in, in Spotify if you're a, a, a premium uh, user or a free user or an unlimited user, etc. If you calculate all the combinations, you, if you have a 20 million song catalog, I think Spotify is about 20, 30 million, uh, 200, almost 200 countries and nine types of permissions, which is a fairly realistic amount, um, you end up with very huge data sets if you want to represent the whole thing. If you use a Boolean, if you use a, a flag that, contain, that is able to represent all this data where each permission is a single bit, then you have a very small data set. It's 34 meg, it fits in two laptops or one server, a one, one commodity server that anybody can, can buy and have. So the point is not so much being very anal about, oh, I don't want to use much memory and premature optimization, but these kind of changes are the difference between writing a system that you can run on a single server, and then you have two or three or four instances, but they all have the complete set of data, and you don't need to worry about anything else. You can scale this very quickly, very easily, just by adding servers. If you go to the uh, to represent this with a, a single Boolean, then you need to shard all the data in multiple servers. And the moment that you do that, you're running into distributed systems problems. You need to care about consistency. You need to care about clients knowing to which, which shard they have to go for, to find the data. Da, 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 da. And that is very complicated. So it's not a matter of saving hardware resources. It's a matter of saving developer resources that need to be worrying about this, and testing it, designing it, writing it correctly, et cetera. So um, one very basic and common recommendation is to do something like that. Every time that you use primitive types, especially, you really need to do that. Use the primitive types. It's going to be smaller, and it's going to avoid all the, um, the object header. In, uh, in Scala, you can use value types, which work more or less something like that, but they are extremely limited. Um, you have the limitations in there, although they are in some ways pretty useful. You can add the uh, several methods. So you can have a, an int that has, I don't know, in this case it's a counter, so you have an increment method. Um, and you also need to consider that this is a long, so you have 64 uh, bits in there that are very useful for multiple things. You can pack many things in 64 bits. Uh, this thing in here is not going to create more allocations in the general case. And also for Java 10, whenever it comes, we'll probably be dead by then. Uh, Project Valhalla uh, is uh, including value types into, into Java 10, which will be uh, extremely useful. Uh, this is another example of a very fat or of a fat data model. And, and this is something you won't probably won't do in, in, the, in, in real life, but it's, it's similar, and you can probably get examples, more real examples from here. Um, here you have a user that has a bunch of fields, a representation of a user with a bunch of fields, and you create the user from a string. This could be a, a, a line separated with all the fields separated by commas. So the typical thing to do is do a split, 
and here we are separating by double colon. Uh, you do the split, you create every object, then you parse it, and then you put each of the fields in the name, in the, in the birth date, da, da, da. This is nice, and it's convenient, and whenever you access all this data, it's there and it's ready for you, and you don't need to construct the data, the date, uh, etc. It has one problem, which is that for every user that you create, you will be creating these many objects. If you have one user, two users, 10 million users, 100 million users, and you want to keep those in memory, then this is going to become a huge problem. So, um, yeah, this, this is... Uh, uh, pointing here that uh, we, whenever we cannot aflo uh, afford to multiply the data set sizes, we need to consider if our internal representation of the data, the modeling that we are doing on this uh, on this subject on the, on, on the user, does it really need to map the external contract? So you you can do tricks like that, like this. You can have uh, you can keep the data, the original data, the line of data with all the separators, but do lazy um, lazy parsing of the data in this way. Whenever you somebody accesses the, the birth date, at that point, only if you didn't parse it before, then you go to, the, um, to this find field method, which simply iterates through the string, finds the correct uh, chunk of data, cuts it, parses that, and returns it to the, to the date. And then at that point, you assign it, keep it here, return it, and whenever somebody else comes, it will be there. So it's, it's very basic lazy initialization, but if you have uh, five, seven, ten fields, this is going to save you five, seven, ten objects that you may not be accessing on every request. Uh, there's a lot more other cases where this is useful, especially uh, hash maps, that's a uh, mistake on uh, hash codes. Whenever you, gener you calculate a hash code for something, depending on what you have on the object, for, how for example, you have a list, you're going to go and traverse the list and calculate the hash map, the hash code for every single element, etc. and then you're aggregating all that and then returning the, the hash code. If the data that you have inside this object is immutable and it doesn't change, you can just cache the hash code and keep it here. Whenever somebody comes and asks for the hash code again, you return the same value. You need to be careful with mutations if they happen, etc. But it's it's um, caching this data and, and lazy calculating is is useful. Um, okay, so Guillermo is taking over. Good luck with this thing. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, I'm going to uh, focus on um, techniques you can use to uh, fix your application when um, basically a set of conditions meet. Okay, you have already fixed all the low-hanging fruit uh, for bad memory management uh, in your application, like uh, things that are just plain bad practices. Okay, uh, you have to in your GC. You have an application that uh, processes thousands of requests per second and is generating GC on every request. So every time you improve the uh, performance of your application, let's say you are processing 10,000 requests per second and somebody very smart comes and makes the application twice as fast. Then suddenly, if you were generating one kilobyte of uh, garbage in every time you process a request, suddenly you are you have doubled that amount of garbage and you have doubled your GC churn and probably doubled your GC pauses and, and increased your uh, latency jitter. Okay, so and, and your application uh, is sensitive to that. You 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 care about latency, okay? Uh, so in 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 those cases, uh, there are some uh, things you can do that uh, present trade-offs uh, that can make you um, avoid doing allocations in the fast path of your application. If you do z zero allocations in the fast path of your application, basically you should ideally have uh, zero uh, GC pauses. Uh, no, no, you, you, should, you should run without GC, okay? Okay, so, uh, so um, as I said, these techniques have, have are usually trade-offs, are things that you usually wouldn't naturally do when you program. So uh, uh, they are usually intrusive to your, to your application. So if your application is very latency sensitive and, and you want it to be high performance, process lots of requests, uh, you probably want to know this upfront and, and design for it. Okay, and also as a caveat, I would say that before going and optimizing an allocation, you should try to, uh, you should definitely prove that 
uh, there is a problem there. Uh, you should micro benchmark uh, because uh, some things the JVM does for you. It, it optimizes things away from for you. Okay, and it, you shouldn't care about it if it if that piece of code is not in your fast path and generating uh, garbage when uh, when you process every request. If if it's something you do uh, from time to time or you do an initialization or something like that, it shouldn't be a problem. So it's it's basically uh, you care about things that um, are um, linearly proportional or proportional a function of uh, the number of requests you process because uh, as you increase your throughput, it you increase your uh, the garbage you have to uh, the GC has to to clean up. Okay, so the, the first case would be uh, objects that you create instantly uh, and, and you create and throw away instantly. And this, if you program in Java, this happens, and, or Scala or any JVM language, you know that this happens all the time. There are many APIs that require you to, to basically do this, okay? Um, the JVM has an optimization for this. It's called escape allocation, uh, but it's very hard to know when it will kick in. Basically, escape allocation uh, means that it's uh, something the JVM does in the case for which in C++ you would declare something on the stack of a, of a method, okay? So in C++, uh, you declare something on the stack, you use the object, maybe passing it to some other functions, and when you fall out of scope, uh, everything you declare on, on, on the stack uh, goes, goes away automatically. So uh, in the JVM, if I create an object inside a function, I use it, I, I don't give it to anyone else, I don't save it outside of my scope, and, and my method ends. Uh, it doesn't make sense that I would have to allocate that object in the heap and then uh, have the uh, garbage collector do work to free it because uh, that object could be have been freed right there. It could have been uh, allocated in the stack actually. So since the JVM doesn't do allocations in the stack, um, it does this uh, escape analysis the, the at runtime that trying to find out whether an object ca that an allocation can be optimized away. Uh, the only way to know if this has happened is to do a micro benchmark and with, with that piece of code and, and really know uh, whether you have to, to take care of that or not. In case you have uh, such a local variable that um, you are creating and throwing away and, and it's actually creating garbage uh, in every request, one thing you can do, what you can do with it is promote it to an instant variable, very bad uh, programming pattern, I know and uh, reuse it on every call, and then you would not be making allocations. As I said, these are, these are trade-offs, okay? And you have to be uh, very careful when you, you do these things with uh, safety. In this case, uh, if, unless you make the instance variable uh, a thread local, uh, your method will eventually have become a uh, thread unsafe, okay? So this is about uh, escape analysis. Um, this would be an example of uh, that case. I think, well, Gallup made this slide, so I, I don't know where the code does. Uh, but yeah, this would be the case, for example, okay? Uh, the function at the bottom is creating an object, and then it's printing it out, and then it's uh, falling out of scope. So there is no reason why the, var the variable A should uh, be allocated on the heap, okay? The only way to prove that this is happening is to do a micro benchmark. Uh, you can also uh, switch on and off the escape analysis uh, uh, when you start your JVM, but uh, I think micro benchmarks are probably much better for this. Okay, another um, another uh, hotspot for uh, in this case are collections. Okay. Um, you may have collections where you put and, and remove elements uh, as you process requests uh, from, from your clients, okay? And uh, some of them are maybe creating garbage, and that that's what we are trying to get rid of here, right? So in the case of lists, always use array backlists. Never use a uh, linked list if you can avoid it. So if you, if you use an array, an array list and you size it properly from the beginning, it should probably never need to be resized, and it should cause it should never cause any new allocations for your for your uh, application. If you need to use linked lists or trees, I think the only option is that you build your own intrusive uh, implementations. Intrusive impl implementations of uh, data structures mean are those where the pointer to other nodes in the data structure are, are embedded in your objects. And I, I haven't researched, I don't think there is a library to do this in Java automatically. So I think you have to really do this every time uh, for, um, Every time that you would need this, you would need to build your objects with the with the pointers to the to build the data structure. 
in the case of maps and sets, the situation is very bad because uh, maps um, basically uh, create unsets because are, which are backed by maps uh, create a map dot entry uh, object every time you insert. So if you have maps that have a lot of churn per request where you put things and and, and remove them. Um, every time you add a, an element to the map, you are going to be creating a, a map dot entry, and any, every time you remove an element, that entry will become garbage. Okay, the only solution to this is to move the maps either off process to a cache like Redis or Memcached, or off heap. Okay, off heap. Uh, I will talk about this later. It basically uh, is manually um, managing your memory outside of the JVM. If you're using queues, again, like list, use them, uh, have them, make them array backed, make them uh, bounded, which also gives you back pressure, which is uh, also a nice design property. And if you are, if your collection, if you are storing primitive types in your collections, be aware that they are boxed when you add them, because Java collections can only store uh, objects. So um, try to f use implementations of collections that are specialized in primitive types and will not allo make allocations when you insert an int, for example. Uh, uh, I, there are links uh, to them later in, in the presentation. Actually here. So for primitive types, uh, there is a Trove library and OpenHFT has uh, specialized collections that work on, on primitive types. Of heap implementations of maps, uh, also, OpenHFT has um, has implementations, and there is a project called MapDB, which has several data structures that are off heap. Okay. If you want to move your maps off process and put a cache, which maybe could be shared among several processes, like uh, basically a, a caching, uh, a memory caching system, uh, and it could be even off box. Um, just be aware of, of one thing: your the client library for that cache, caching server should also, if your goal is to not have allocations per request, should also use a, have an implementation that doesn't produce garbage when you try to ask things to the, to the, uh, to the cache. Otherwise, you didn't, uh, you may have one other things, but you didn't help in, in, with our goal in, in this context. In general, if you're using third-party libraries, they may be a, a source of, of the um, garbage you are trying to get rid of, and sometimes uh, you should be ready to either totally scrap them and, and roll your own or find other alternatives or live with that. <coughs> Another technique is interning. The JVM already does this for some objects. Interning is the, um, the act of basically uh, keeping uh, a cache of um, frequently used uh, immutable objects. Okay, so for example, if we were talking about boxing, but if you try to, if you Try to run a, a benchmark when you, where you prove boxing and you use uh, byte instances. Uh, you will see that they are not creating garbage because the, the, there are only 256 values possible, so the JVM has them cached. Uh, the JVM also interns uh, strings. It has a cache of strings. Normally, uh, strings that you create will not be cached. Uh, it uses it automatically for uh, things like class names. But you can ask for a string to be interned, and the JVM will uh, will keep a copy that it, it will it will share forever and for the lifetime of your application. Okay. Um, so basically, this is uh, uh, interning consists of a cache of, of uh, objects that you can query by a key, and you will share a single instance of that object. That's why it has to be immutable for all your application. Uh, you can do this for any. W you can do this. In which case, can you do this? You can do this when the set of possible values uh, of an immutable object is known and un un unmanageable. If you know how much the, your interning, uh, intern uh, cache uh, will grow, um, uh, and you can live with that uh, usage of space. Then it, that's and you can build those objects based on primitive types uh, to query the the cache. Uh, then that's a good case for for interning. Okay. Uh, again, you are trading uh, space for no uh, allocations. Okay, you are, you are probably you may those objects may may not be in use, so you are trading memory footprint for latency, not having uh, GC pauses. Again, a trade-off. Okay, um, you should uh, consider also making the, these caches thread local. Otherwise, your interning cache cache need would need to be thread safe, and you would incur in coordination costs when you get objects from your from your cache. Which would, again, uh, add one more interning cache per thread, 
in, uh, making it another trade-off of space versus uh, CPU. Another technique is um, using object pools. So let's say there, are, there is a type of object, uh, maybe, I don't know, something that represents your a request that uh, you are using all the time in your application and has a, a complicated lifetime. Like you don't know when you will stop using it, but uh, at the point that, that it can be forgotten about, you know. Okay, so in this case, instead of allocating any object every time, you can have a pool of objects and, and take objects from there. I think this is a very common, this is not a very weird pattern. Uh, people do this uh, in many languages. And you, you can get objects from there, use them, and when you're done with them, release, okay? Um, this is a, this is a, a, a very, very uh, obvious option to save on allocations. There are a couple of caveats uh, when you do this. One is that it introduces the very real possibility of memory leaks in your application. So if you take an object for, from the object pool and you fail to release it back into the object pool, you have essentially created a memory leak. So you have introduced memory leaks in Java, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Uh, also, if, if your objects are complicated and they point to other objects, when you release them back into the pool, you should uh, clear them to avoid them being sitting in the object pool and pointing to other live objects in the application, keep them, keeping them fakely alive. And that would also be a memory uh, leak until somebody comes and takes again that by chance that object from the pool and overwrites that uh, pointer. So that's another, po that's another um, way of um, adding a memory leak. Another technique is something I call uh, object stashes, uh, and it's basically a, a special case of an object pool, okay, which uh, would um, relieve you from the responsibility of doing the lifecycle management from the objects in the pool, okay. Basically, let's say you have a um, so, uh, some kind of objects that you are using during your processing of a request. Okay, but they don't transcend the request. You know that at the end of the request, they are done. They would be similar to the um, to the uh, the first case that that I mentioned, where that are local variables. Okay, but they maybe they they live longer than just one method call, and then they will, they are passed around between several components, and at the end of the call chain, they, you you forget them. Okay, so these objects are confined to processing a request. Uh, you let's say you have a thread that processes the request end to end. Okay, so you know that all of the objects that of this type that the thread uh, allocated when it was processing this request are free whenever the request is done being processed and, is, and the thread moves on to process the next request. So in this case, you can, you can have an object pool without lifecycle management. You take objects from the pool, and at the end of processing the request, you tell the pool, hey, I'm done. All of the objects, consider them available again. And you don't have to release objects. You just take objects, forget about them, and at the end of the request, the, the pool is full again automatically. Okay. So this makes object pools, object pools much more convenient if they fit the, uh, this use case. Again, you should have one, one, one of these per thread. This is, uh, by definition, this, these ones wouldn't work without being per thread. This would be the example, okay? So you have an, you have an object, uh, you, you do some work on it, you have another object, you do some work on the, other, on, on the two, two of them. I would imagine this would not be all in the same method because otherwise uh, it wouldn't make sense. And then at the end of the processing the request, you, release, you tell the stash to release all of the objects and, and you start over with the next request. Okay, you're still responsible for not leaking objects outside of this request, otherwise you would get very weird bugs where objects are being used by to uh, parts of your application with different meanings, okay? And also clearing objects if they point to other data, you could also get w weird effects like that. So it's again, not a very good programming pattern and, and, and a, and a trade-off, okay? Another, um, another way of avoiding allocations um, is basically moving your memory management off heap. Okay, you, you forget about the, the garbage collector and the JVM and you manage the memory on your own. There are two ways to get uh, memory of heap. One is using byte buffers. You can use either byte buffer allocate direct or use a, use a memory mat file. Uh, that would be a mat, mapped byte buffer, okay? And then they have an API to put and, and get values. You can also get uh, slices of byte buffers. They, they have a very nice API. 
And the other, this is very frequently used for RPC protocols. Okay. Uh, the other is um, uh, some misc unsafe uh, can has an API to let you allocate memory directly and write and read values from from those uh, memory areas. Okay, it will just give you uh, allocate memory will return along, which is just a pointer. Okay. Okay. So going of case is related with serialization and deserialization because, for example, if you're using byte buffers, you have memory of heap, but you don't have Java objects on, the, on that memory. You have, a, you have an array of bytes that you need to somehow make sense of, okay? So um, there are serialization libraries that are usually used for RPC protocols, but you could also use to store objects of heap uh, that um, have, are built with the goal and achieve the goal of having zero allocations. So you can serialize and deserialize objects to and from byte buffers without allocating any memory. Okay. Uh, the two of them I'm linking here is one is uh, simple binary encoding. Uh, the link is there. Uh, and the other one is flat buffers. Okay. They are basically the same. The idea is the same as uh, protobufs uh, or any other RPC uh, definition uh, language and library, but with uh, no allocations. Normally, you just you have a byte buffer that you manage yourself. You could have a pooled byte buffer, so you could have a huge uh, direct byte buffer and build slices on it, or have a, have a ring buffer, for example. And you tell the library to you, you point it to an area of that memory and tell it to serialize or deserialize a message. Okay, so that would be a, a byte buffer. Uh, and let's say there is a, a message right there in the middle. So you could, uh, when you call slice on the byte buffer, you basically tell it that you want another byte buffer that only uh, shows you th that one record. So you can have many, uh, let's say this is like a flight weight, right? You can have many, um, a, a huge area and then have many, uh, you can pass around build by buffers that don't overlap their, their, the message they should be working on. Okay, and I think that this is it. I'm fairly new. I'm fairly new to uh, Shipstead, but I, I've had this in the past where we built up a very large application that was very performance and latency sensitive, and and we had our major problem was uh, GC churn and, and latency at some point. Okay, and uh, it is hard, yeah, because I mean, do you know what? First of all, when you start over, you don't know about any of these things. Uh, you start thinking of you start thinking about it when you see the problem, and. Uh, <laughs> And then you look at your system and you know, maybe you can, you, we actually, we actually figure out what we had to do in every part of the system to have zero allocations, but the work in a, in a large, uh, in a large application uh, to uh, get all of that done would probably be over a year. So we, uh, it, it's a long-term effort, but usually the low hanging fruit get, gets you massive improvements. It's like, it's like everything. But yeah, the, the, you can imagine that if you have uh, your application is built with um, normal Java code, code that you write casually, uh, or the one that you would write if you don't think your application is performance sensitive. I don't program like this normally. Um, if you want to, com if you think about converting that to having zero allocations, it is a very long path. But you can probably get uh, big benefits with moderate effort in many cases. One thing that 
Um, after that process, I think uh, one thing I would highlight is the importance of measuring absolutely everything from day one. Sometimes in Sister, for example, we are lucky that we are in a situation where we are starting a lot of projects. There's a lot of greenfield projects. Um, so with this experience, one thing that is very important for me is measuring absolutely everything. Because it gives you a view of how your application is behaving. You can start seeing if some parts of the application are generating a lot of garbage. And maybe you don't care about them today, but you have that in mind. And you can warn people about that. You can design your application so you can cut a chunk and replace it later. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would add that. That is very important, not necessarily applying these techniques, but measuring all the time so that you know when you may need to apply them and have that in mind every single day. That's much easier than changing from one day to another. Yeah, so I have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying is uh, have uh, performance in mind from day one, so design for performance more or less, right? <laughs> Maybe. It's, it's like security. You, you don't add security or, or you don't add policy like that. Hmm. In general, it's, it's not Maybe not necessarily designed for performance, but um, for example, in the we were talking a lot about the, the fast path. So if you are designing something and you know where the fast path is and you know what the chunk, the pieces of the fast path are, design them properly so you can change them. Because, and dumb example, if you get your DTOs, the representation of your DTOs, and you put those in the database you suddenly have your entire application coupled, and good luck changing the serialization format. If your application is well designed, and that's general good design principles, and the transport that, and the communication that is doing with other services is isolated, and there's a layer, and then changes the layer, you can change the serialization format relatively easily. So it's not necessarily thinking about perform designing for performance from day one, but good design principles. And they, they uh, leak into the performance benefits later, I think. I, I would phrase it like that, maybe. Mm -hmm. How how do you handle this uh, sometimes overhead with the product people who are pushing to get features? Because it's there's a very simple way: just get the metrics and translate them into money. That's the only thing you need to do. If you are, for example, and, and there's a very simple uh, example, there have been a lot of studies already made by Google, Amazon, Facebook, blah, 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 about the impact of five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds in the load time of a page. That usually translates into talking to a few microservices, and you're doing serialization, and you're just taking JSON strings and serializing and deserializing in seven different microservices. There's your argument. The, the sales are going down. Every time that we make an improvement for 10 micros milliseconds, sales go up by this. You translate that into money, and then that's it. Sometimes what happens, and that's a problem for engineers, is that the, the money benefit is not really that big. So it's frustrating for us, but maybe the 10 milliseconds are, don't translate into the same money that it costs to pay you for a year. It's not always the case that you need to do this. I, I, it's not always the case that you need to go this far and, re, and have zero allocations. And it's, it's a very extreme uh, goal to have. But that sometimes makes sense. I have a question also uh, about object pulling. Hmm. If you use object pulling, it means that uh, all the objects inside the pool will be treated as uh, in all generation phase. Hmm. And then it means that my application will grow and grow forever. For example, in, in yes. Mm, well, no. Well, not grow and grow, sorry. I, I, I don't, <laughs> Until. So I don't imagine you want to be able to handle an infinite amount of data. So you you, you have to have some bounds. You, yes. Your well, your pool of objects, you have a limit. Yes, of course, the object pool has a size. Yeah. But I'm talking about if you have bits of whatever, then it makes the, the those object pools get inflated for a while. And all the objects will be kept inside the old generation. I'm, I'm talking, I'm asking more about, uh, for example, uh, what are the quick wins of those techniques? Um, because an object pulling, it seems a quick win for something. Some uh, it's a trade-off. You're trading uh, latency for memory because you are going to use more memory, mm -hmm. but you are going to have less latency because you're not going to have less GC buses. That's a trade-off you are making. It's a decision you have to make. Okay, but. Um, 
for example, uh, latency, of course, is very important for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, even more with microservices things and so on. And it means that every uh, little object that I need, for example, uh, when I'm we were talking about the different stages that we have between isolations, mm -hmm. we have the, the, the DTOs and maybe the AP models, uh, version of those objects and so on. It, it seems that you need an object pool for uh, every layer. And the size of the object pool will be replicated for each layer. I, you need an object pool for things that outlive a request, which shouldn't be so many. Well, okay, you're talking about only the, the path of the, the request path. Hmm. Well, yes, we are talking only about the request path because that's that's what the only thing that's proportional to the amount of requests that you process. And I'm talking only of that object pools. It only makes sense for objects that live longer than your request. If by the time you're done processing something, you don't need the object anymore, you don't need an object pool for that because you know there that the object is not needed anymore. Yes, but I was talking more about, uh, for example, uh, if I have uh, 10,000 requests of the same uh, service, let's say on the same service, it seems that uh, I will use uh, 1,000 times the same object. I can reuse it. Yeah. Okay, 1,000 1, times, let's say. And it seems that uh, object pooling is very useful precisely for this, for this case. Hmm. So I'm reusing from one request to another, not inside the same request. No, no, that, that would be the case that I was calling object, object stashes. Sorry, the terminology is uh, homegrown, but uh, that's not really that. An uh, no, stash is something that you only use within this request, so it can be much smaller. You are not going in, in a single request, let's say you have objects of type foo that you want to reuse. In a single request, you're going, not going to uh, allocate 1,000 or need 1,000 objects of type foo. You will need a handful. So a stash would only usually contain a handful of objects. That, that you can reuse every time in every request. Yes, well, I was talking more about not about stash, but about the traditional object pooling. Yeah. Uh, going across requests, not inside the same request. One, one point in there is, and talking related to the design thing. Yes, it is useful that you have a pool and you have uh, 10 threads processing requests and they all go to the same pool and fetch the object and da da da. Problem that you may find in the future while scaling. At some point, you don't have enough with a machine and you need to move to another machine. It's much easier if you have designed your application in such a way that requests are completely isolated from each other. So you, every request is a single thread, and they, all the resources they use are their own. That's very good for performance in the concurrency context, because they share absolutely nothing. There's no contention between threads. For example, one typical problem with a pool is that you have n threads hammering the pool. And in essence, you have done away with, uh, with concurrency. You're not having concurrency. If you design the thing so that you have stashes, a number of, sta of uh, threads processing requests completely isolated from each other with their own stash of objects, if you want to scale that outside of a single node, it's trivial because you just take one thread or n threads and move them out. And you are, you're managing your application uh, capacity per thread. You know how much capacity a thread can do, how many objects of this type a thread will uh, need for, to serve a single request. And you can manage those individually. You can move them to another machine, keep them in the same one, etc. And there's no coordination. Whereas going to a single object pool and sharing it, it looks more useful. But in the end, as you start growing the thing, it may not be as useful. Right, so not sure may, if it makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, you can. There, there's some cases where you may want to have, for example, a cache. For example, the, the string uh, uh, data. Well, the, the string cache. When you intern in the JVN, that's a shared uh, instance. After all this advice about uh, control, uh, control and allocation in my JVN, and being a SCAR aficionado, hmm. uh, I'm interested that, uh, about your opinion about the functional programming and immutability. Uh, if the JVM is, uh, is ready, is optimized enough to, to put this kind of, of pressure, uh, creating this kind of objects, uh, etc., uh, for a <coughs> production application. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's quite no, that, that, I mean, I think my view on Scala essentially it's an abstraction layer on top of uh, Java. Every time that you do abstraction layers, you're paying something in exchange. 
again, you could write things in C, or you could write things in, in assembly, and you're trading off. You're making a trade off. Scala gives you a lot of things, and we actually, at least me, prefer to write Scala in the day-to-day -day work. But there are parts of the application where you need to be careful about what you do with Scala, and you shouldn't be doing um, uh, lambdas or etc. Because you can't afford it, because it will start generating closures and da, da. I was talking about immutability. Immutability is, is a similar problem. Like uh, it's very nice and it's very useful, and especially in a concurrency context, is extremely good problem if you are creating a lot of instances all of the time and throwing them away and every time that you make a copy of a list that's a common problem in in, in Scala you make a you add an element to a list and then you're copying the whole well not the whole list but maybe instances if you can't afford allocations then you can't do that even if it's useful I say in the case of immutability for functional programming it really kills me that really most of those objects could be declared on the stack and you can't do that on the JVM and I I, I I don't think you, you have a, there's a solution for that because um, this, the trick we showed here, this is something that you do exceptionally. If you are doing functional programming and you have uh, tons of these cases, it was, it's just your code is going to be unmanageable. So uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> More questions? Okay, so thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, I think upstairs we have something to drink. Uh, no. Yes? Oh, awesome. I'm sorry. So, we go first. Wait for me? No. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Guillermo. And yeah, let's see you upstairs.